Maplewood Village Post Office and redevelopment plan. This is the follow-up. We had a meeting earlier uh, in January. We put the notes up on the uh, Township website. Hopefully you got a chance to look at those. And tonight we're going to hear from our planners, um, the firm of Phillips, Price, and Greigel. Paul Greigel is here and he will uh, give the first presentation and we'll deal with some questions and anything that you have we will deal with uh, in due time. Okay, so Paul, hey, Paul you, and Paul. Good evening. Also Paul Phillips, my partner here, uh, and Paul Greigel, principal of Phillips Price Greigel, planning and real estate consultants. Also a Maplewood resident, Paul is in South Orange. So we know the site, we know the area pretty well, but that said, the people who are in the room here tonight, many of you here last time as well, know the post office, know Maplewood Village better than we ever could. So quite frankly, you know, we have a lot of ideas here, but we want to bounce them off you. Uh, the purpose of our meeting tonight is to follow up on the first committee meeting, January 19th, it was held. So I'll give a short recap of that meeting and some of the things that were discussed, and then jump into uh, what we've come up with out of that first meeting in terms of some points of concern, in terms of ideas that were raised, and what we think about them, and then to try to put them together into a framework that can uh, go into a formal redevelopment plan for the post office site. We're going to be done by 9 p.m. Uh, I hope to take about 15, 20 minutes on direct presentation and leave a lot of time for questions, for discussion. And we have a relatively small group so far. Maybe we'll get a little bigger as we go forward tonight, but it'll be, I think, a lot of time to hear from each of you individually. In terms of the first meeting back in January 19th, uh, this will be repeat information for those of you who are there, so I apologize, but I do see some new faces. Just want to make sure we're clear on what we're talking about and what the purpose of this process is. The Maplewood Village Post Office and a couple of adjacent parcels are in an area in need of rehabilitation. It's a technical term that essentially gives the township the right to write different types of development regulations for the site and to have control over who will eventually take over the property. Maplewood currently owns the property, but through a, a series of a couple of leases, I believe, uh, makes it available to the Postal Service through a third party. Uh, but that lease, those leases will end in November of 2013. The township has made it clear that the post office has to move out by then. So we're dealing with the existing post office building that you can see up on the screen, as well as a couple of adjacent parcels to the, we'll call it the south, uh, towards Village Coffee and the north towards Rickleton Square, also shown here in blue on the tax maps. <coughs> as the mayor mentioned at the first community meeting, uh, I took the notes, so we put them up online, so if you want to read a full recap, you're able, you can do that on the township's website. Uh, there were two main objectives of that meeting. Again, to provide the context we're dealing with for the redevelopment of this property and to obtain input. A couple of key points that we made. Redevelopment plans are better than zoning in a lot of ways in that there's more uh, ability to be very specific about land uses and design than you can with zoning, and there's more control for the municipality over the timing and the form of development. Also, uh, what's important here is the plan does not call for eminent domain. These are all township-owned parcels, so we're not talking about taking private property uh, for a public purpose or turn over to developer for a non-public purpose. Regardless, again, we're talking about no eminent domain being used as part of this process. Mm. I'm not going to read through all of these, but there was some discussion at the last meeting about the township's master plan re-examination adopted in 2011 by the planning board. This document dealt a lot with Maplewood Village. Uh, there were a number of goals and objectives that were relevant to this property and to Maplewood Village as a whole, talking about things such as increasing the quality of commercial development, increasing sustainability, those types of things. Uh, they all relate to this property. More specifically, the planning board did address the post office site and had some ideas for what would be appropriate there. Those are listed at the bottom, so we'll read those very briefly. Retain a retail storefront postal operation. Uh, again, there's been, I've been looking online, there are certainly concerns from people about the uh, post office moving out and what it means for local businesses and others. The idea is to make sure there's some type of presence where people can mail packages, buy stamps, that type of thing. Uh, but the mail sorting component is more of a <coughs> type operations. A lot of trucks, a lot of employee vehicles. 
so it would be appropriate to move that out of the village. And the planning board thought it's a perfect location for multi-family residential with ground floor retail. Lastly, in terms of parking, the idea is to ideally increase the amount of parking on site compared to what exists there today for our, as far as public parking. Just to wrap up on the last public meeting, I listed a number of uh, ideas that were raised regarding uses. Um, again, sort of consistent with what we talked about in the master plan re-examination. <coughs> Good reason that a site like this, there aren't really too many things that would make sense. We're talking about a three-quarter acre site, so you couldn't have a large corporate office facility or something on that scale, but you have the ability to put mixed-use development there. So there was certainly some support for that. Uh, but a number of concerns were raised as well. Aesthetics, the appearance of this building, what kind of material, how it will look, how big it is, um, parking and circulation, and generally impacts on the community and community facilities. There were a few questions though that came up that I tried to get answers to or would like to clarify tonight before we move forward with the uh, future uh, ideas for the site. Some ideas were raised about a market study of prospective uses. As I mentioned just a moment ago, the issue here is we have a site that is really limited in terms of what can be accomplished on it, in terms of its size and its location. So in our experience, Paul Phillips in particular, working for over 30 years in redevelopment and planning in New Jersey, we have a good sense of what works next to train stations in downtown areas. So I don't think there's a need for a formal market study per se. But we'll certainly consider economics and impacts on you know, development feasibility, impacts on the surrounding area. There's also some thought to expand the study area, whether to include Brickleton Square for the uh, expanding parking uh, possibilities, making change of the green space, that type of thing. That may be possible because the township owned property, but as far as looking to the Cleveland Village as a whole, that goes beyond the scope of our engagement. And again, it's something that might be a little bit too much to deal with at this time. But the township committee is aware of the concern. The mayor is here tonight. There's other members of the township committee here. So certainly that's something that they can consider for potential additional future studies. As far as the traffic study, that was raised about dealing with circulation issues. I believe at the last meeting there, I did mention the Township Committee is interested in having a broader evaluation of traffic issues. Parking is already being addressed to a separate study that's underway currently. So they hear your concerns about that. We certainly will make sure that park, parking and traffic concerns are addressed. Lastly, the issue about the number of school, uh, school children, public school students, always concerned, certainly in development. People worry about tax implications and uh, whether schools can handle additional children. Uh, I would point out generally, multi-family development does attract a lower number of school children, particularly when located in the transit. And to follow up on the point, uh, there's a lot of information here. I'm not going to go through all of it. But what I've done is taken some multipliers, some standard numbers for different types of development and compare them. And the numbers don't mean much in a vacuum here, so looking at you know, one unit, 1.5 people, 0 0.06 public school children per unit. I think what's more useful is to compare different types of development and apply these multipliers to them. So if we were to assume, let's say for argument's sake, 50 unit development, whether here, no road, wherever, Two people, uh, two bedrooms per unit. How many public school children do you expect to uh, <coughs> see per unit? Yeah. You can see the numbers are actually were transposed to the computer. Here. The numbers from the prior one should be up there for the public school children. So just go to the final column here. We have if we apply the numbers of units to the overall uh, number of the projections for school children. These are the numbers you end up with. And then my apologies, there was a error in this in the PowerPoint that just got next to the computer. We're talking about roughly eight times as many public school children projected for even a typical apartment, a two-bedroom apartment, away from transit versus one that's transit-oriented. Again, my apologies, we'll get the corrected numbers after the meeting for you to look at. Uh, we're talking 1.3 children expected in a 50-unit development close to transit versus 10 students in a typical two-bedroom apartment job with 50 units. 19 in three bedroom townhouses, you know, up to, if you have single family homes with four to five bedrooms, over 40 children expected. So there's dramatically different impacts. These are based on real numbers from developments throughout New Jersey, 
based upon reputable sources. Uh, so suffice to say, public school children, it's concerned that this type of development we're looking at in this area typically does not have those types of impacts. Turning towards the future, towards the plan for this site, we come up with some considerations uh, to guide the project on this property based upon what we've heard so far from the community and what the township committees told us. What are we dealing with? The key location, right in Maplewood Village, but also next to the train station. This is a very rare opportunity for Maplewood, or for that matter for most towns, to have a site directly adjacent to a, a major train station a half hour ride from New York City. The site is rather large in its context, but really we're talking about trying to put a lot of different things on there. There are ideas about community facilities, raised at the last meeting, ideas about the supermarket, cakes moving across the street, parking, all these different things. You start putting that together, three quarters of an acre is not a lot of room at all. Um, other constraints, the site slopes downward from Rickman Square towards Village Coffee Company. That can be a problem in terms of building heights, that type of thing, but also it's an opportunity to grade parking, to grade buildings, to uh, dig into the grade to, uh, to fit more development. Uh, in terms of retail, the big issue we're dealing with, the Midwood Village, I'm sure the shop owners are aware of this and landlords are aware of this, it's not a really strong retail location in the traditional sense. It's not on a main true road, it doesn't have visibility from a highway or from a heavily traveled roadway. So you have very unique type of users that want to go there, They're generally destinations. Uh, but also, it gives you a little flexibility to come up with something a bit beyond the typical, you know, having the pressure of a big box retailer wanting to come in, that type of thing. We can be a little more selective with what the retail ends up here. And lastly, the township is looking to have developed that makes financial sense, but without overwhelming the site, overwhelming the surrounding area. In terms of objectives for the uh, redevelopment of the site, we've laid out a few in consultation with the township's economic development committee, the township committee. Uh, first, this was raised at the last meeting. We understand there's a desire to see public benefits on the site, but the big public benefit to township residents, taxpayers, and others is to maximize the value of this property, but again, to be careful in terms of its context. So you're not overwhelming the surrounding community, you're not doing something that's completely out of character. But again, there's a lot of value in one of many properties like this. How do we do that? The new building that's consistent with its setting, it's a mixed use downtown, you have trains nearby, you have to be friendly area. Looking at scale that's similar in size to what exists in Maplewood Village already. Green building, this is the township committee's desire to make sure that you have sustainable development and LEED certified buildings, also affordable housing provided. As I mentioned before, as the planning board said, and as we'll say again, the amount of parking that exists today should remain and be expanded if at all possible. And concerned about traffic and circulation, so if you start changing uh, driveways, parking lots, that type of thing, there may be impacts. We want to make sure there are no negative impacts on uh, circulation patterns, and certainly that pedestrian access to the train station is maintained or improved. Okay, what we're going to go through next are the potential parameters for a redevelopment plan, which typically included uh, with some of the topics we talked about last time, so we tried to come up with some more specifics tonight. This is permitted uses. Again, we're not reinventing the wheel here. This is a site that makes a lot of sense for ground floor retail space, potentially on the second floor. Someone raised that idea last meeting. I would say that's probably a reach, but you know, there's no reason to not permit it if you have a particular user that thinks they can make a go of a two-story restaurant or retail space and the developer thinks it can work, great. But it's certainly active uses running on Maplewood Avenue, ground floor retail. Um, larger spaces would only be permitted we're recommending for a grocery store. So essentially, Kings moving across the street or another grocery store coming in would make sense as a downtown anchor. Otherwise, smaller retail uses are what we're recommending. In terms of upper floor residential above the retail space, <coughs> um, on Donnell Road in the redevelopment site there, only one and two bedroom units are permitted. That could be the same type of restriction here. Uh, we recognize there was some concern last time about having larger units, maybe attracting wealthier families, retirees, that type of thing. The issue is you start potentially attracting more people, more school-aged children, having different types of impacts. So typically, transit-oriented projects tend to have one and two bedroom units only. Um, 
Likewise, the issue of condo versus rental. Ideally, in some people's minds, condos are better in terms of making people buy into the community. Just right now, the development market doesn't work for condo development. Um, so we think the flexibility should be permitted in terms of the tenancy type. And again, as we mentioned, some affordable units should be set aside. <coughs> Turning to the post office component. <coughs> so we'll make it clear the scope of this plan is not to figure out where the post office goes as far as its sorting. There's other people dealing with that. The Postal Service has to figure that out. The Township Committee will be involved. Uh, but the thought would be to hopefully through this plan try to come up with some ideas for where it goes, if there's space on site for a new postal retail facility, or if there's some type of arrangement that can be worked out nearby for that type of uh, facility. It may not be something that's worked out immediately. If the Township Committee is negotiating with the Postal Service or there's other things going on that may have to wait. Uh, but again, the goal, the intent is to maintain the retail presence in Maplewood Village. As far as community facilities, the idea that was raised last meeting was to perhaps have performance space, something like that that would uh, be an attraction. It's a valid objective. The issue is Maplewood already has those types of facilities nearby, right where we are tonight, as well as you have the Civic uh, Community Center at the Hart Park, we've got the Art Gallery at Springfield Avenue. <coughs> Our feeling is that next to a train station in the village setting, there's only so many things that can go there. You're better off with revenue generating uses that fit the character of the area. Uh, last in terms of parking, uh, certainly looking at structured parking as part of a building, the issue becomes whether it also allows some surface parking, uh, actual lots adjacent to it. Question? Question? Yes, could, yeah, yeah, sure. It uses office buildings, uh, the office on the second floor? And that, kind of? that could be a possibility. You know, that certainly would make sense. Um, from a market point, we probably residential is going to be driving this, but you know, there's no reason to preclude it. So we'll make a note of that. That's a good, very good point. Let me just try to get through the rest of this, and we'll have plenty of time for this. That's a good question. Let me try to get through most of this. Uh, in terms of height, before we get to what we're recommending, let's just set the context. Maplewood Village, um, Generally lower scale, but there was a significant number of three-story buildings. And I, you know, I've lived in the town five years, and never really paid too much attention to heights until recently. But I counted up, looks like about seven, seven buildings that have three stories or greater. Now two of them on the bottom is Bank of America and the theater. It's the rear portion away from the street that's that's taller. But there's at least, it looks like four or five buildings running on Maplewood Avenue or um, just on the side streets as well that are three stories, 35 to 40 feet in height. Uh, so that's probably the tallest we're looking at along Maplewood Avenue. Um, there are a number of shorter buildings, two stories in height. But I think one thing to, to keep in mind, you can see from the photos, is that there's no one dominant style of Maplewood Village architecture. Clearly, there's a diversity of different types, from the Michael Bank building to Anthony Garuba. <coughs> but it's you know, at the time it made sense. Uh, but certainly, as far as we get the building design, that type of thing, there's some latitude, some, uh, latitude for developers to work with. Great question. I'm literally about to get to that. Oh, yes, that's, uh, yeah, I want to just set the context here. So, great question. So, our suggestion is three stories up to 40 feet on Maplewood Avenue. But then you get into these other questions. How do you measure height? Um, the zoning ordinance goes from average grade to highest point. The problem is a sloping site. You may have some limitations fitting the building into that uh, requirement. One thought would be to have a maximum of any one point. So at the lower part of the site, you're allowed three stories, as well as at higher points on the site. This is going to take some work, certainly perhaps some modeling, some drawing up different ideas. Uh, but that's what we're looking at now. Generally speaking, the three stories, roughly the same type of uh, height as you have existing. I would suggest, though, that also perhaps to the rear of the property, additional height could be accommodated if it's set back from the street. You can have a couple of examples in Maplewood already, and we'll show a couple of others from other locations where there's greater height uh, further back on properties like this. One other thing considers potential minimum height, so you don't have a, uh, a very short building that's out of character in a different way. It's you know, a 10 foot tall, one story building. There are some currently, but I think on this site, perhaps to the minimum as well as the maximum height requirement. The other thing with regard to height and how you measure it, this was brought up last meeting, are rooftop uh, equipment. Uh, elevator shafts, HVAC, that type of thing. 
Uh, and another room plan makes it clear the height includes all of that. So that may be the same way to go here to have, if you know there's a number, whether it's 40 feet, or whatever the number that's worked out, everything has to fit within there. In terms of density, number of units, amount of development on the site, we're going to hunt on this a bit. We're not quite sure of where to end up with the exact number here. What I'm going to do instead is show you some examples from other communities of similar type projects, and then maybe we can work out, you know, get to an idea of what makes sense here. Uh, in terms of setbacks, zero feet is what you have on most buildings today. It sounds pretty uh, tough, but it's, you know, most of the buildings are right up to the sidewalk, right up to the property line. We'd suggest doing the same thing here, and perhaps having a maximum as well. Um, one issue is to the, what again, we'll call the south, to the village coffee, you have windows on that side of the building. I think you'll need to have some type of setback, a 15 foot perhaps, to that building so you have kind of a courtyard space between the two. So the light and air are not uh, diminished for that property. <coughs> to the rear of the railroad line, perhaps <coughs> five feet, even zero feet to the rear. There's really no one impacted there. If you have windows that are soundproof, that type of thing, you can build right up to a property line facing the train line. Okay, let's look at comparison to a few other projects. Uh, let's start with the Maplewood, the Manila Road property. I just want to put some facts up on this site. It's a bit larger, uh, closer to one acre in size. Its density is 59 units an acre. Uh, 50 units are proposed and approved for that site. Uh, that is a four story building that's been approved there. Uh, three residential stories over parking. 60 parking spaces, 1.2 per unit. The difference is there's no retail on that property. It's very close to the train station going the other direction, as you can see uh, from this map. So that gives us kind of an idea of what's been being done elsewhere in the, uh, in the township that we might want to look at as a starting point. Um, relatively close to here, the Avenue of South Orange. Um, all I remember from this presentation is, ooh, I don't know if you want to show that picture here in the rear, but it's, it's telling that in the, uh, it's a pretty big building there. The issue, you know, is how it's designed and broken up. And architects and designers may agree or disagree on the appearance, but the key thing I want to point out, though, is that along the front, on Bose Avenue, you're talking about three-story buildings. To the rear, it's four, and actually with these uh, dormer things, it looks like almost five stories to the rear. So that's what we're thinking about, something similar, perhaps, on this site. Again, I think it will come down to how it's designed and how it works. What's the height? Uh, I don't know about the height. In terms of numbers, we just came up with this, you know, the other day, digging around, couldn't get all the details out of it. But again, it's three stories fronting on Bose, which would look to be close to 40 to the peak. Uh, it's pretty high floor to ceiling on the, on the retail space, and then two residential stories with a peak roof. That's in the site. Um, and the site back. actually does slow down as well. So that's where it's actually somewhat similar. That's very close to the train station, and it has a slope a bit larger, one and a quarter acres. But that, I. <coughs> We need to do some more checking. That may include the eating gourmet site, the restaurant there. That's the difference. They have a grocery store, but it's on an adjacent. Some of the eating parking is underneath the building, so it's not quite apples to apples. But we, we, we just thought of this as something worth looking into. Because in, in the end, by the way, parking is probably going to drive everything here. So we think this is worth you know, getting some more information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More digging here. No, so no. I think so. They, it was built to be condominiums. There was no market. They switched to rentals and they ran it like that. Yeah, just on their website, they said they were leased out pretty much. So that's one. What are they renting for on average? Uh, I couldn't say off the top of my head. I didn't. Not important. Okay. Just move along to a couple other examples and then come back to uh, change the batteries. <laughs> Vic's already uh, upper man. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Cranford, not too far away from here. Cranford Crossing. Pretty neat project if you have a chance to go by there. That's on South Avenue, just out about a block from the train station. Um, 50 units, a bit larger site again, but that site includes a full on garage, a full size garage that is the rear. So it's not, there's no parking underneath the buildings as we'd be perhaps recommending in this. Maplewood, uh, but it says retail on the ground floor, two stories on part of the project, across the street there's retail with three stories above it. So again, we're in the same general range of three to four story buildings with parking. You know, these are parking spaces, 310 spaces for commuters, shoppers, retailers, residents. Uh, 
just for comparison, gasoline comments and cell phones is on third. Uh, residential only, so it's not an exact apples to apples either. Uh, but it's a larger site, 200 units, <coughs> still over 40 units per acre. That's the measure of density. So all these projects are at least 40 units per acre, up to I think it was in the 60s for Cranford. Um, again, four stories there, the three residential over one, just like the on road. So again, to wrap up on density, the type, the amount of development we're looking for, we don't have a number in mind yet, but I think the range we're looking at is going to be similar to those other projects. Again, over 40 units per acre, similar to what you have on Donnell Road, perhaps. Just some thoughts on building design, because there's been a lot of concerns raised about this, and we agree it's going to be key. Building materials need to be uh, consistent with downtown character, brick, stone, that type of thing, perhaps metal accents. These are just examples from mainly North Jersey, including in uh, Morristown, the project Paul is involved with, by the Epstein site. I point this one out to it's a green building, right? It's the parking lot. It's lead platinum. No, lead platinum. So it's got the, what do you call those sunshades. Shade, like the sun shades. It's got all kinds of passive energy features. Uh, a bit taller than perhaps we're looking at on the street, but just to give you an idea about another concept of breaking up buildings into a base, a middle, and a top that helps define the character of a building. So we're looking at regulations that do that type of thing. Also, if you have a long building, this is a pretty wide site compared to a typical 50 or 75 foot wide site. Uh, having something that breaks it up, whether it's, in this case, a pretty uh, intense uh, corner feature, but also something a little less um, you know, big at that time. It breaks up the mass of a building. Here's an example of a book I find kind of interesting. It may not work in this setting, but again, changing building materials, stepping things back. There's ways to break up big facades and buildings. Uh, so we're certainly looking to do that in the design regulations. One other key is that active uses on uh, Maplewood Avenue are important. Retail spaces, glass, that type of thing, consistent with downtown. In terms of site design, long list here, but we're looking at things that the Village Alliance is considering in its updated uh, design standards, where he has some of its design standards. Uh, trees, landscaping, street trees, that type of thing. Um, trying to make a pedestrian-friendly environment consistent with the streets policies, trying to make sure that this fits into the character of the area. So things such as the sidewalks would be important uh, and the design of street furniture, all those types of things. A couple of things we want to think about going forward is on the south property line, where I mentioned you probably need a setback to the building, perhaps some kind of open area on views where people walk through their benches, a new connection to the train, and that's an opportunity to do something different, but it will change circulation patterns. Uh, I would suggest on Maplewood Avenue continuous street wall, that is buildings the whole length. The question being, if you want to have circulation stay as it is, having a driveway through, that will be broken up. So someone will need to have the traffic study look at whether you can get away with circulation to the rear of the property or other ways to get cars around the site. So perhaps you don't have a break other than for pedestrians in the street wall. Parking and circulation. Again, we don't have all the answers tonight, um, just some things to think about. Issues raised include the connection to Rickerton Square to the rear. It looks promising. Uh, we're looking at aerials walking around back there, but it's just going to take someone to lay it out and see whether you can have a driveway through there, whether it works with the grade change, uh, whether you have a garage facing one side, a second garage on a lower level on the other side. That may be a possibility. Uh, but clearly, big picture as far as parking, shared parking between uses, residential has different needs than retail spaces. Uh, so we're looking at probably around a space per unit for the residences, but also any additional parking would be shared with uh, retail spaces. Uh, so again, a couple of the questions I just raised about perhaps extending parking on the rear, underneath the building, behind the building. We'll need to do a little more study to figure that out because the things we're considering. Public amenities. I mentioned already about public parking, it's just examples of ways you can fit into a building. I saw some hobo in the other day, I've never actually seen that on a bike rack. Um, it's true, it is free parking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, free parking for cars as well. Hobo is that big thing. Uh, you pay $10 an hour to park. So I think bike racks, uh, bicycle parking certainly makes sense. And here's another picture from the Morse and Epstein's project, what I'm talking about when you use or cut through. Um, somewhat similar, they have benches, they have lighting, they make it a, an inviting public space that perhaps could even have outdoor dining or something that's wide enough. So I would suggest that the south end of the site there is a, should be consideration of something like that. Okay, so just to sum up before we get to the discussion, 
things we've we put forth as being part of the uh, plan framework, subject to hearing from you, subject to working with staff uh, as we deal with the site a little more closely. So the committee uses ground floor, retail, upper floor, residential, and or office. Uh, height three stories in the front, four stories in the rear. No setbacks to the front and side, uh, rear, but to the side and the south. High quality building and not parking to serve the uses. With that, let's call you anything else down the mayor. That's the framework we're looking at. I've got a couple of slides that you can, uh, if you want to refer to anything to see, either the site, the project area, or an area we'll see in the context that have them available. Otherwise, we're suggesting just going right into uh, into discussion here of these various topics. So, I think you have a question here. Yeah, I, I, you certainly covered and touched a lot of bases. One thing that I think is pretty much missing on that is uh, has to do with bicycles, except for that one last okay. slide. Uh, there's been a lot of work in Maplewood uh, from the Township Committee on down and from uh, community groups on up on making biking a serious alternative to Maplewood. Nobody's saying you're going to get rid of cars uh, in, in the town, obviously, but you want to make bike use a serious alternative so that you actually decrease the amount of parking needed and make it an obviously healthier alternative uh, option. Uh, right now, Maplewood Avenue is not a good, not the best place to ride unless you're a, well. A, a lot of a, a lot of less uh, comfortable riders aren't happy on Maplewood Avenue, and, and you've got an interesting possibility behind the building now. I mean, you had talked about zero or five feet setback, but you've actually got a path from Baker all the way to. Um, the other end of the, or all the way to the train station, if you can go behind uh, where the post office is now, and you could have essentially a pedestrian and, uh, and bikeway that can allow somebody to go the entire length of the town, ignore, uh, essentially avoiding the, the traffic on Maplewood Avenue. You suggest an existing sidewalk that's there. Yeah. And continuing. Continuing it right now. Right now, if you're on that sidewalk and it comes to a stop at the back of the post office. So that you have the potential there for a great bike path that then takes you from Baker all the way to the residential end of Maplewood Avenue um, at relatively low cost, I would think, to be able to do that like, in this redevelopment process. So I, I, I was a little disappointed I didn't see that there, but I see you taking notes on it. No, no, I appreciate you pointing it out. Uh, we tried to get a lot of information out there. I didn't want to you know, talk for an hour and a half straight. But yes, that's a good point. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I mean, if you touched on this at the beginning, I apologize. Um, as far as the, uh, the supermarket is concerned, the supermarket goes in there, supermarket doesn't want to go in there. Can it be built so that it could, in, in theory, handle the supermarket more, and that's not going to work? The boutique shops, uh, is, there, is that an idea that you guys have discussed, uh, discussed obviously? Yes. Being able to, within five years of the, uh, mm -hmm. the project, being able to rebuild, you, you know, re reassemble, whatever, with the ground floor. Yeah, I'd like to have Paul weigh in on this in a minute. I'll start by saying the idea of the redevelopment plan would be to allow retail broadly as a use, to start there, and then to work with the redeveloper, because that's where, where redevelopment plans, it gives real benefits to the township that you can get very specific and say it has to be a grocery store, or it has to design that could do that. So the plan may, not, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, the plan probably won't go to that level of detail, but I think that would be more appropriate dealt with by the, uh, again, the redevelopment, the redevelopment agreement, perhaps. Well, you can do a combination of both. I and mean, you can permit a certain size, for example, if it's going to be a grocery store or food store. And you can put in requirements that, for example, the size of any other retailers have to you know, be within a certain threshold, uh, which probably also would better respond to the, uh, to the, to the market. Yeah. And that can be that we can dealt with both in the plan and the redevelopment agreement. But I think we can, you, know, you can deal with that. I, mean, I would suggest that any developer is going to want to have the option, you know, right. to go either way. That the way you design it, you make the columns spread out. I'm not an architect, I don't know the overall design, right. the column widths, you know, how it's worked out, and you could fit it in there if necessary, and otherwise you put up a partition wall, break up the space, and something right. else. And the other question I have is, are you taking into consideration the villages that are probably, it's going to be very hard to get through this village during this project. That's going to make it, I mean, for all, are we going to go one way, get rid of two ways in the village, you know, I mean, that's, that to me, it seems like it's, yes. you know. Yes, you know what, we didn't talk much about, at all about that, quite frankly. Yeah. That's a great point. I've already heard that concern from some individuals, yeah. um, from the Village Alliance has raised this point already. Um, yes, we're going to need to figure out a way to the staging in terms of how parking can be moved. Yeah, because that, you know, you start digging up this site. Yeah. 
Especially yeah, going on the ground, ground so parking like that. Yeah. 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 We'll have to do a little more on that. Like, let's go to the far back first, and we'll work our way back. Um, I came in late, but I noticed that in the end, you talked about building and pushing out to the lot lines, with the exception of the south side. Are there any provisions to create street side, you know, if a restaurant moves in and want to have a street uh, side, sidewalk cafe, anything like that? I know some of the restaurants right along the street have trouble getting some cafe tables. Some of these news areas we talked about um, could potentially have that as well. That's a good point. Let me make a note. I think that's something that could be put into there. I mean, especially when we have a pretty wide, just, I think it's a good referred to is the width of the sidewalk. Do we know what the width of the sidewalk is? And the sidewalk, we're only it's narrower on the uh, east side yeah. than the west side. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I was also going to point out, it's a pretty wide site, so you're going to want to break up the building anyway. It's one building. <laughs> sure. Perhaps you recess in certain spots would give you a natural place to do that. Mm -hmm. But we make it different. We've made provisions for outdoor dining and in, uh, other redevelopment plans, so we can, we can look into that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, about student generation earlier. I'm wondering, you know, the size of this site, even in the worst case scenario, I mean, is student generation really relevant um, to this development of site? Just because it seems like it could be that we just have to be a small site to have such an impact. It's a fair question. I, again, given the numbers I've looked at and dealt with elsewhere, it's not a concern as far as I'm concerned. But there are people that have raised the issue, and we want to make sure it's out on the table that um, there is empirical data that shows it's student. You know, families with children generally don't move into this type of development. And is there a lack of capacity to demonstrate in the school district right now? I haven't moved yet. I'm not familiar with that. I know some of that issue was raised. But again, I would argue that if we're talking about 50, 60, some of the odd units of this type, it's very low numbers that you'd be dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, in, in addition to the permitted uses, having office buildings and office space on the top there, this may not be, excuse me, I have a uh, lost my voice, but uh, on the uh, other side, the Kings does come over, and this is probably beyond your purview, but if that's privately owned, uh, could there be some way of uh, tying that in? Because I suspect there'll be additional commercial use for the old Kings mm -hmm. property, and uh, I would think you'd want to unify the approach. Yes, that was raised, I believe it was raised at the last meeting as an issue. Again, it is strictly speaking beyond the purview of the redevelopment plan, but I can say the Township Committee is certainly concerned yes. about that. Mayor, mm -hmm. if you want to say anything else on that. Well, the, the, there's a two-step process here. First, we have to have the plan, and then we have to use the plan to go out and get requests for proposals. When the proposals come in, we see what developers are talking about. That's when we start negotiating. Mm -hmm. And what, our conversations with King, which is right here, is that if Kings was to move across the street, then Kings would find something here that would be um, complementary to their supermarket there. Uh -huh. So it wouldn't be another food store. Uh -huh. So it might be a restaurant, might be a drugstore, uh -huh. might be something like that. So they, they all believe that. Yeah, it's a little complicated. Kings does not actually own it. The people that, the, the, the um, private equity group that owns Kings owns the land and then the Kings rents from the private equity group. So it's a little complicated, but they have a 20-year lease on this property right now, and then they would sublease it or buy out of the lease to get somebody else in there. Yeah, one of the problems with Kings right now, in my opinion, is the lack of a real storefront. Mm -hmm. So to what extent will the town be concerned with the lack of a storefront on the new building? There's a lot of conversation about the size and, and, and what the space is going to be of, if there's a real opportunity here to introduce some storefront on Maplewood Avenue and also <coughs> improve the pathway to the train station on the uh, on the little coffee shop side of the building, which is really just a poor alleyway and not there for the town, but heavily used. I mean, it seems to me there's a lot of opportunity there to maintain uh, uh, um, some, some frontage for small businesses, if not mandate any large occupant to maintain storefront. Just so everybody knows, and we didn't say it, but this building is coming down. This building is not going to be converted to something else. This is going to go, and something new is going to be built here. So it gives the opportunity to be very creative because you're not going to well, be constrained. I, I, I that. That. That's why I'm asking, what's the issue? I mean, to what extent are we going to be concerned with the overall impact of the building on, on, on pedestrians to want to be around it? Very, very much. Certainly, that's, again, one of the benefits of redevelopment plans versus zoning. 
that you can legally mandate X percentage of uh, different types of windows, fenestration. What, what, what the storefront's going to look like yeah. about fenestration, yeah. glazing requirements. <laughs> you can write that right into the plan. I, I can't be late, so I don't know. Yeah. Did you talk about that before? I'm not that, not that little detail, no. That seems to be a big component uh, of, you know, how tall is on, on the railroad side of the building is really, that's not really an issue. To me, that's, that's not going to be trying to deter people from wanting to walk through a town. It's more about the storefront, what's going to happen at that level. I can assure you it's going to look better than the current king. <laughs> it's not very attractive. And that's, that's what we don't want, is just to have that. How do you assure that? Right? You, build you, 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 you build the design standards. Put it in the kitchen in the plan. Put those standards in the plan. Storefront would not be in keeping with the Miller client design standards for storefronts in a matter of life. So yes, it should be referred to as part of the plan. Yes, the yeah, village alliance said that they, they do stand corrected that there already are design standards, certainly because it's a special improvement district, and there are certain standards in place for storefronts. So this would have to be consistent with that. And in fact, those are being amended currently and soon should be uh, updated to having a bit more teeth to make sure that the active you know, streetscape is promoted. Okay, so exactly. we'll, we won't do that. Okay, before you get to Virginia, just one question over here. And then, Yes. Um, the, um, the question I have is, I, I think it's a very appealing plan, and I, I like the street well continuity that was just mentioned here as one of the facets and the, the improved commutes through to the train station. It's extremely appealing. My question is really about the constraints that this site presents as, I guess, 0.74 acres or 0.75 acres. If it adjoins public land, has thought been given in this minute and addressed, to whether it should really be a 1.2 acre uh, development to optimize the flow and to achieve a desirable footprint for the retail so that it has better viability and can serve as a, a, a real benefit to the community. Is there the possibility that the site instead of a square should be rectangular and that it should spread uphill you know, towards Rickleton Square or that Rickleton could be in some way we be find in a beneficial way that would be more focal and more you know, wonderful for the community, um, not less is what I'm thinking, but that would somehow just really sort of break outside the box and do something really great as opposed to just, okay, you know. There's been thought because someone did raise that issue and they you know, said, the fear of something blasphemous last time, how about we include Record Lynn Square and move things around? There's actually a lot of agreement that it could make sense. Um, the issue, one issue is just that the, re the rehabilitation area shown in blue on this map is limited to those properties. But the town already owns Rickleton Square the Street and the park. I mean, there also would be green acres issues perhaps if you're taking park space and replace it. Uh, but this has been brought up with something we'll consider, and I think it's certainly worth Exactly. Can you comment on the viability of retail within the ground level of the, the building? Because I think one of the, the, the problems in the village is that the retail spaces are so small. Um, it's very quaint, and you know there are a lot of benefits to that, but maybe if we were to look in a new direction, we would be looking still to keep the character of the village, but to bring in something that would in some way enhance what we have here. Well, one one uh Comment on that as I mentioned before, maybe I don't know if you heard the comment about the fact that uh, Maplewood Avenue is not a through street. So the village is generally limited in terms of national retailers and others. You need visibility, you need access. So even if you allow for a larger building, it won't guarantee you're going to get a different type of tenant. Um, but beyond that, uh, again, we can certainly look to come up with designs that play the constraints. Again, there's a lot of dining already, so some people may say, well, more, more restaurants, but if you can have space with outdoor dining that's not there now, that's a possibility. We can try to work, you know, work up concepts such as the news on the south side, where you have something that's a little different but fits in with the character. But it's definitely a concern. I think making the site larger could, you know, open up some possibilities. Again, there's just going to be issues trying to figure out the circulation and parking, you know, what impacts would be if you move a driveway, if you have the connection in the rear. Exciting opportunities, but something that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Oh, Jenny, yeah, um, just in terms of what the building is going to look like, and making it really contextual. And I know the uh, Village Alliance has designed guidelines, and they need, but I think it needs to be emphasized that materials need to be natural materials, not man-made materials, such as hardy plank and other kinds of things that 
would not fit into the context of the existing buildings. Agreed, definitely. Yes. Um, you, sir. Um, one of the things that I think we're all very proud of with our downtown is that there is a, uh, a connected street wall of retail from one end to the other. And that makes it unusual because it, the, the continuity creates the sort of the vibrant pedestrian uh, experience. And I think one of the great opportunities here with uh, is the fact that we have an ability to actually extend that, that experience uh, by, by going from yeah, the corner of Village Coffee and creating a new kind of you know crescendo at the end here where you move to the square. Uh, I would really encourage us to look at the urban design of the whole streetscape and how this missing tooth opposite end of the road can really continue that. <laughs> I mean, again, we're thinking of that, so I'd like to hear if there's any other thoughts, you know, the counter thought that people <laughs> prefer to see a driveway there. I mean, you know, I think you're most more against uh, you know, breaking up the street to have, uh, you know, to have cars driving through, but that's what's there today. So, mm -hmm. I, again, I think it's a great point, but again, if anyone else has a counter opinion, I'd love to hear it. <coughs> uh, yeah. Well, I'm not against the idea of extending the uh, retail street wall, but if you're looking at this particular view, you can see where the, the uh, parking lot between the current post office building. Uh, I'm thinking of Madison, where there is, in fact, a perpendicular uh, retail area off of the main street, and how successful that is as a uh, traffic calming and also a, a sort of a retail cluster, whether or not uh, there could be <coughs> more than just a use, but a, a, a break to the living area of Maywood Avenue uh, with a cluster of or some sort of uh, space or plaza that would function as a pedestrian corridor as well as a, a slight turn in some of the region. Uh, just a, it's just a result of looking at this particular view. We've lost consensus already, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, though. This is, I mean, this is the kind of things we're planning with that we're going to have to try to figure out. Uh, yes? Uh, just a potential counter argument to the development for that. Uh, driveway there. Uh, I, I go through there all the time. There's just no way, no egress out the other way. There's almost practically one lane uh, by the, you know, by our Toros. And, uh, you know, it, it, to get in and out of that space, it's, it's and parking, I mean, it, it's almost impossible to move and people are backing up and turning around and waiting for people at the train station. There's all kinds of stuff going on there. You block it up. And I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, that's a fair point. And that's, again, why we be prudent probably to look at Brickland Square as part of this whole package. Because you'd start you know, assigning different drop off more to one end or the other. Then you relocate the access to the subway tunnel. So, great point. Uh, you, so but then, to yeah. support that, if you're looking at circulation all the way around, you also have to look at the far other end on uh, Baker. Because, and that whole, I think everybody agrees that, that, that Baker and, and Maplewood Avenue is a terrible corner for traffic, for pedestrians, for bicycles. So, and there's been a discussion already of needing something there to redesign that corner. And then maybe if it doesn't get done before then, then if you're doing a circulation plan, maybe that would be the time to make sure that happens. Because you'd be having a lot more people, maybe turning from both directions into the that back lot if that becomes your break. If you don't have, if you turn the area next to the coffee house into a views, which sounds like a lovely idea, then the only way to get in there from that end of town is off Baker Street, mm -hmm. right? So you're having a lot more people come through there, so that whole thing has to be reconfigured and, and the circulation has to be thought about. So. What about roundabout at uh, Baker and Maplewood? <laughs> 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 yeah, we're just uh, flying eggs in all across the highway. Everybody's got to think about something. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the last thing, somebody brought up the, the concept, and I have no idea what the practicality is, that actually it's subterranean parking under what's now Lincoln Square. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, in other words, you know, and, and then you might in fact be able to expand the open, the open space on top. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't know what the engineering practicality that all is. The, the dollars and cents of that, that's going to be tough. But um, should be put on the table? I, uh, it's a very interesting observation that commuters would be far more prone to use a parking garage than retail uh, customers. The, the retail customers really prefer the surface parking to right. be able to get in and out. I would agree.
agree, but commuters could be drawn through the, the <coughs> to use a garage. As would residents of a building who also would have a different peak in some instances, yeah. because again, you'll park where you have to park if it's in your building. <coughs> For that matter, employees oftentimes are stuck in garages for that very reason, because if you say you can't park on the street, you have to park there. But um, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, I, I think it's vital to keep a food number of that. Uh, I think King's has done a great job, but they do have a limited variety, obviously. Uh, by moving across the street, they can have far more offerings for the shoppers, the residents. Uh, in the, the additional building. Uh, I'm uncomfortable a little bit with, with 40 new residences going in just across the tracks. Uh, do we really need a, more additional residences in that whole overall area? And is it really feasible to instead have more services, offices, various other things in the place of additional residents. Uh, another point, I think somebody should talk to the postmaster to find out for him to take a survey of all the people. I've heard there's somebody like 50 people that work that out there. Uh, where do they park every day? And just, just where is it? And so that we have a feel of how many spaces will be deserted once they move out? Uh, that could help answer the question uh, if we have construction vehicles uh, taking away some parking lots during the time of the construction. Maybe that will balance it out. It will give us a feel at least of that. And that's easy. Uh, also, uh, you're caught, it's a big frame of the building. Uh, I think the idea of having parking down below, possibly for the employees of that building, get them out of, out of the way of the other spaces, uh, that could free up a lot of other spaces. I don't want people going in and out of an underground one, but if you have people who work all day in those buildings, that can be that can a good part of that big underneath uh, area. <laughs> yes. What worries me is, is the apartments. That's an extra 50 more cars that can be put in this town. And on Saturday, it's, it's almost impossible to get around unless you walk into town, how much traffic there is. So you're talking about an extra 50 cars on a, of trying to get in and out of a small area. Don't you? Again, we're certainly going to value traffic, not us, but the traffic firm will be dealing with that. And we'll make sure every developer has to also Yes, sir. I, I have a number of comments. Sure. Um, the scale of a lot of the buildings you showed as examples in Morristown, uh, South Orange, and Hoboken, I believe, to me appear to be a larger scale than um, perhaps the, the, the dimensions being worked out, but they seem to be a greater scale mm -hmm. than um, we would want for Maplewood, at least in my opinion. Um, those are much more urbanized areas. They have much wider thoroughfares which can handle those types of buildings. I, I think we have to think very carefully about what we want to put here, which is obviously why we're having these meetings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a suggestion that goes in kind of another um, direction in part about a public or community space. There's there's a kind of a tradition in Europe, sort of especially in Italy, where you have some small scale retail streets and they'll have a covered center area. Um, we can have a building that would give us a public space in the center, almost like a small scale version of the Winter Garden downtown in New York, where places where you can just go. There's no place in Maplewood now where I can pick up a cup of coffee and a sandwich and go sit somewhere unless I'm a patron of a restaurant. Um, it would also give us a, a space to use as a community um, for events, a kind of an open space without being a performing space at some time. You could have in that, um, you could have a full through community's uh, public space that you could enter from the direction or from the side, and you could go straight through toward the tracks and actually have pathways integrated into it that go in the direction that we go to the train from there. So I could envision somebody coming through there early in the morning and getting a coffee in there early for the train to sit there and read the paper if they don't want to sit in the train station. Um, that kind of thing, we could incorporate that with um, some
some of the small scale retail tax spaces we do have in the um, And um, it could be incorporated with some retail space, but we see some problems with retail space in town. We have already had long negotiations in the community in town about this building on the other side of the tracks, which some of us are not so happy about. We, we need to see what the impact of that is on town before somebody else can be getting 50 new residents. Um, anyhow, I, wish, I, I would like to see a building with a lot of light and glass. That could be used for the public in that way. Um, in, as far as residential is concerned, um, um, the, and going into parking, residential use needs a lot of parking, whereas retail use is more transient. People come and go. If you wait, you find a spot. People leave, you go into the store, you run to the post office. But residents need to keep their cars there all the time. Um, I think we have a parking problem in the world already, although we have three or four good sized lots. I'm not sure if we want to do anything that's going to exacerbate the parking problems. Um, if anything, we had this discussion a number of years ago in Maplewood when um, there was a big discussion about putting up a, a, a three or four story lot for New Jersey Transit. And people in this town decided they did not want that. And that's why we have the chicken, which is a very successful service. So I could see perhaps discussing expanding the chicken service to the retail area. You know, if you're just going into town for your things, you might you might be fine when the jitney comes through. Just like it does for commuters. Um, and lastly, um, I I would wonder Mayor's talking about um, discussing an art for a developer. I would like to suggest that maybe the town starts by talking to an architect rather than going to a developer. You could even consider an architectural competition and get some really interesting ideas for a gem spot in a gem town. I think it's something that you might want to consider. Um, you're going to get, as far as I'm, from my point of view, I'm an architect and bias. Um, I think you'll get a, a much more interesting and well-designed um, product if you start with an architect rather than a developer. Thank you for the comments. Uh, just one. Clarification on the, the first one you raised about the buildings. <coughs> <coughs> intended to say we should be building whole book in size. Well, it's more just to show the um, ways you can break up building mass through different materials and such. So just so it's clear, we're not saying a six-story well, or eight-story building. Well, those are the kinds of that we use to substantiate the building and the building on the other side of the town. Very similar to building examples. So I think we need to be careful about scale. Okay. Uh, you've been pulling your hand for a while. Yeah, thanks. A couple things. Do we have any knowledge of what used to be there before the post office and how that whole city center was designed? Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 Town Hall? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 The school, yeah. right. Yeah. The school and yeah. Town Hall and, and the yeah. library yeah. before yeah. Memorial. Do you know what the scale of those buildings were? It was one late 19th century building. It was very it's small compared to what's there. But taller. It was taller. Actually. Yeah. So because the three right now it's roughly a story and a half under two stories, and, and the proposal shows it at three stories. So it's definitely going to cut in on sunlight and then they will have hitting along the movie theater and all that. So I, I think some concern should be in terms of the street front scale whether it steps back to allow sun into the street. Uh, number two, I'm, I think everybody's alluding to the uh, comments about. Uh, you know, we bring in a parking garage, we're asking more cars into the area. We're also talking about pedestrian and park spaces, so we're mixing cars and people. And I think we really need to define which is it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not a big fan of parking garages, especially in this area. They're just asking for trouble in terms of, uh, you know, violence and things like that. No matter how secure they are. But I think the biggest thing is just, I think we should look at history as an example of what was there and, and at least as a uh, as a model, you know, in a sense, because of all the buildings that were uh, built at the same time, two scale and things like that. And lastly, is there any uh, mention for LEED certification or yes, sustainable design? Yes, yes, the council made it quite clear that we'll have to require this building to get LEED certification. Yeah, LEED certification. Yes, because that may also speak to yeah. without a park. You know, there is no cars. It's more bicycle friendly. Uh, uh, 
going back to what you said in the very beginning about parking for residential units there, that uh, overflow parking would be in the, the township area. So that has me concerned because it needs to be on some of the spaces that, that uh, you know, town people are trying to use currently. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying if someone doesn't have space, uh, yeah, and, you know, you, you allow a certain amount of spaces for, for the residential uh, mm -hmm. units, but if they happen to have two cars instead of 1.3 cars in their new mm -hmm. figure, then one of those cars is going to be parked out in the area where uh, someone going to one of the local stores would be parked, and that's a concern. And the other concern. <coughs> Uh, support someone else mentioned that the traffic patterns would be a problem. <coughs> just, just last week, I, it took me five minutes, literally, to get across this street on Maple Wood Avenue. Five minutes from one corner to the next corner. So, and that's without any additional people parking in traffic. So it has me a big concern because, you know, it's always a problem getting through Maple Wood Village on Maple Wood Avenue. But it could be really a big problem if, uh, if we have an additional further cars for more of them. Great. Thank you. Who has any Yes, you have any. How do you define you. affordable housing and how many units would you expect to have them? Ah, good question. Uh, there's there's well, the mandated way we're going to get the uh, uh, It's a state yeah. definition that goes on a four county basis. Mm -hmm. So whenever this gets done, okay. Ready, then there's at that time there'll be a calculation of the different um, income streams per family size, and then uh, that's that's the basis upon which you select tenants. We have been using a 10% standard, so uh, on the building which replacing the, po the police station, there's four units of affordable for and 46 market. So something would be something like that. And could you <coughs> possibly have more? No. no. Well, you could if you chose to. But you don't have to have more affordable housing, but you can if you want to. It's, it's not possible. possible. It's not possible. <laughs> it's not possible. It's not going to happen. Well, I didn't say the market would support it. I said it's not going to No, no, it's because okay. it's not possible because. Uh, the builder's not going to build Get it. Get into feasibility. And plus, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, the economic thing. So, and then plus the town makes a contribution for it. Mm -hmm. you have to, in order to make these things work, you have to give a land I work work. in affordable housing. That's okay. what I'm so you know. yeah. I would like to see more. It would be nice. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'd just like to second the uh, suggestion of an interim step of a uh, planner or architect as kind of putting these things together uh, before, you know, that it's not ultimately just a developer who's, who's coming up with the ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think we did, someone mentioned that the last thing I believe, and I think there was some general agreement to doing, at least you know, laying it out. I'm not sure if it went to the point of the design competition or something like that yet, but at the very least, start playing around with the design of the I just want to yes, know that yes. uh, mm -hmm. Okay, over here, then here. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, is there a possibility to do it like a design charrette where the um, citizens can come in and have an uh, interaction and develop that uh, the property? Certainly a possibility. We'll bring it up with the kind of see uh, And another note, um, I, I sort of like Kings the way it is. Um, I fear that if we do relocate it across the street and it gets bigger, you're almost bringing back uh, a large retail store you know, a large box retail store into the area, it will actually be destroyed the facade. Uh, and what we're trying to do is try to keep it a small scale. <coughs> just, just on the whole thing about things. It's not definite that they'll move across the street, so there's still a lot of negotiation. But there is new leadership at King's, and the business plan is different than in the past. One of the things that came out of the reexamination and master plan was keeping a food store in Maplewood Village as an anchor. Mm -hmm. So we have one now, and we're going to have to work with them to try to make them viable. And right now, in the size that they have, they cannot do what they are moving to do more, and that is to prepare, have prepare food for people to buy and take. 
They can't do it where they are now. So it's a, it's a sort of balancing between what you're saying and certainly a bigger score, a story or attracting more people there. You've got more traffic, more parking needs. But uh, we don't want to lose the store because the, the constraints of the space. And they can't do what they want to do. Even though it's a high grossing store per square foot, there are certain parameters that they're going to you know, look at. And if it doesn't meet what they want, you know, they may decide to go a different, different direction or a different place. Just to address that, the current Kings has closed their front side to the street, basically blocking it. So it's backed by the vegetable bins and all of that. So it is possible that you could have a larger retail space, but not necessarily occupy the entire front uh, street frontage with, with uh, display space, um, which is a big difference here between the kind of planning that needs to go here than you would on a larger highway. <coughs> Yes, sir. I'm just wondering if you can elaborate on the, the RFP process. I'm assuming what you mean by that is sort of the announcement to developers this, this area is, is available. And one reason I'm asking is, I think there's agreement that a supermarket is, is preferred somewhere in the area. We keep hearing about Kings, so I, I guess part of my question is, how do we let other like supermarket chains know that this area is somewhat under play? For instance, Fairway in New York is looking at New Jersey. So how can we be sure that they they know about this? Um, the uh, the RFP process is to recruit uh, developers, and then the developers will negotiate with the stores. What what we would and we haven't really thought about what the RFP would say, but the I think the RFP would say that they'd have to come to us with some. Commitment is the right word, but they, they have had some conversations with food stores to be able to bring them over. Now, whether those conversations are with Kings or another food store, that would be up to that developer. Um, again, we want to make sure that whatever we do, we don't chase away what we have now. Exactly. But how does the RFP actually get announced to the developer? If I'm a developer, how do I find out this place? We put it on our website. We put it in uh, in the news record. It's our public. Uh, Place. We have a list of developers that we've dealt with before. Um, you should give us your name. Uh, well, I'm not a developer, but, but I guess what I'm hearing is it, it, are, are, it gets, it gets around. Are we it gets around? But but if if if, if I'm a first-class developer in New York City, and God forbid I don't read the new, news record. How do I find out about this area? We're not in the New York Times. Well, it's unlikely you wouldn't read the news yeah. record if you were a high class developer. And, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, we would, we would make this available. We have developers we've dealt with in the past. We know of other developers. We've talked with Kings. They know of developers. So there's, um, we just develop a database and get it out there. And we deal with the International Council of Shopping Centers. We've been at their things. So if that's, uh, you know, whatever we would take, we would, whatever we would need to take, we would go in that direction. I would say that we're trying to cast the net pretty wide in this case. So if you have a, a contact for a list of other developers that you think we ought to make sure we advertise to, you should pass that on. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That would just be an example of a site in Madison as a redevelopment project. Now I have a friend who works with a developer in Connecticut. They're going after this from the Greenville school site, Madison, New Jersey. You know, out of a, a Norwalk-based developer. The work gets out there. There's ways to do it through the other land student and others. Even for some that's, you no, know, Madison is not in town, but it's, it's further out than Maplewood is. So I think we will make sure that the work gets out. Good. Over on the bench today, so can you, is it possible that the RFP could include uh, the development or, or as part of the proposal requested, the parking lot next to the road property? Well, that's part of the site, so, yes. Yeah, so it would include, so it's again, yeah, the, yeah, the, the baseline would be um, this, uh, again, and I apologize if some people missed the last word at the last meeting or missed the beginning. Um, this is the public parking lot today. The next lot over here, 181, is the post office building, and then this is the regular square parking, the post trucks, and even the row of parking on the train. It's all in the designated area of rehabilitation. So that, at a minimum, is going to be the project site. The idea is to perhaps expand out further the national property. But yeah, that would definitely be part of it. 
Yes, one other point. I mean, there was some discussion of you know the new versus having a complete wall across. If there was a complete wall with no passageway even, then a pedestrian would have no way to get to, to uh, Maplewood Avenue other than at Baker or on the other side of the project, which is a long way to go. So there needs to be, at the very minute minimum, a passage, if not the full view you were talking about. Yes, I think to clarify that. Which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the passage if to one the creates, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm talking about getting, to, yeah, getting from behind there to Maplewood Avenue. Yeah, well, we, we can't, whatever we do here, we have to keep a, a passage to this underpass here. Yes. So we Absolutely. have to figure out a way to do that. Whatever, however it gets configured, this has to be there. So whether we have cars go by or whatever, there has to be a way to get... I just wanted to, because people were talking about the complete street wall, obviously it's a nice design concept, but you have to have at least something there. And I agree, so well, I'm not disagreeing. There has to be something. Yeah. I mean, you know, we haven't done this design, and, some of you are suggesting to get architects, it may be a very good idea. I mean, it's possible to do something here and you put your music, you know, it's all kinds of things. I, so. I think the architect, starting, having the architect working for us before they're working for the developer is a great idea. Well, I don't think it would be the same architect, but yeah. Well, but yeah. having a plan, you know, but it could be also, I mean, having a plan out there. Stop first.
Go ahead. Go ahead. So we keep talking about green, and every day several thousand people travel past that spot on the train. And we keep talking about residential and and affordable housing, and there's really no shortage of affordable housing residential in Maplewood. There is a shortage of really nice office space. And the reality is, maybe there's an opportunity there. I mean, you guys keep talking residential, but the nice thing about office space is people are there during the day. They could get to work by train. They could get to work by bike. They wouldn't have to bring a car. Their cars would not have to be parked there all the time. Um, is that on the tape? The short answer is yes. Again, someone did raise that before, and I, you know, it was not make sure my part did not put in the framework that office could be permitted. <coughs> in our experience, that generally doesn't work in this type of setting. But there's no reason to right now say forget about it. But so I think but, you raised some points that maybe it will work. Maybe maybe it will look different than some of these other locations. The, the idea, though, that everybody trying to be green, green this, green that, is there any green office space in New Jersey? Gosh, I'll have to look at the green platinum building you had <laughs> up before. Is a, there's a, in Marston is a uh, office building. Now it's a nonprofit office building. <laughs> Um, parking authority. It's it's all on profits. The parking okay. authority, the uh, the local CID, seeing eye has offices in there. Mm -hmm. and there's a fourth which escapes me at the moment. But I think the the best we can do. I hear you, and you know we do a lot of redevelopment plans, and we hear this over and over again. Let's get a diversity of uses, not just residential. The problem is, is you also have to take into account what the market's going to respond to. We had right. we did the redevelopment plan in Montclair on the old DCH site. And the town wants to have some mix of uses with the residential office. There's even provision for a hotel. I think the best we can do is be permissive. And, and even you could say we want to encourage diversity in office. But in the end, you're going to, I think, have to see what the develop, how the development community responds. Right. And office in this downtown context is a tough sell in terms of feasibility and in terms of the rent you can get out of it based on the cost of construction. So while I agree with you wholeheartedly in principle, there are these other overriding yeah, issues of feasibility and economics. So my recommendation, our recommendation to the client would be make it permissive. Stranger things have happened. I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. But you know what I think is going to happen is that the residential developers are going to respond to this. But who knows? Actually, you raised an issue about hotel. And again, I don't think it's a site that'll necessarily work. But the master plan did talk about potentially overnight accommodations, a small end, something could work, whether on Denal Road or in the village. Is it a reach? Certainly. Again, that DCH site there, they really wanted to have a hotel fit in there on Bloomfield Avenue or have the traveled roadway. It's not happening. But you know, if, if that's something that people agree with, makes sense to put in as a possibility. Again, the cook net out there and the might say this is a great site for a uh, you know 25 room inn with a restaurant and bar downstairs next to a train station. So I think that would be another option as well. Again, as our gut that the residential works, but we're going to we can allow for more things. Thank you. Yes. Just one other comment. Someone mentioned the back of the building and that um, in, in his opinion it wasn't very important. Um, I actually would differ with that. I think that in many ways our train station, because of the tiny our train station is a very important face of town, and I think we need to consider what the back of that building is going to look like and um, if it's going to be welcoming. Um, there are. Use this example. This is what you see from South Orange Train Station. Right. Well, there's actually a wall there at South Orange Train Station. That's one part of it. But there's this wall <coughs> that's in the movie theater. Is that's horrible. That's on the other side. Yeah, that's that's on the other side. side. But there's a good point. I, I would the, agree. The wall of the path, you know, you ride up there on the train and like scratching. You know, the other person is point. driving through certain towns and just only seeing looking off. You don't see. If, when you stop in Maplewood and you look, not at the post office, but you can get a glimpse through the lot and you can see all the beautiful little shops. It's a beautiful thing out of town. So I think we need to think about that. We're building something. We're going to be rebuilding something closer to the tracks, and I think that needs to be considered. And, and we, we agree, and we've done a lot of redevelopment plans where we make sure that the redeveloper is going to carry the design scheme 
around the building from the front to the rear. And you know, I know how developers think. They think they're going to put all the money up in the front, and the front's going to get the treatment, and the rear is an afterthought. But we can again deal with that as part of the requirements of the redevelopment. We did that with the police um, <coughs> station site, that whatever is in the front is in the back. Yep. And on the side. I guess it's easy. So, please tell me your redevelopment specs aren't going to give us this. Sorry? The redevelopment specs aren't going to give us this. Are they getting this? Uh, that's not the intention, but uh, well, it could be that size, though. I mean, we're, we're honestly looking at height that's <laughs> That's why I point that out. But we're hoping to break up buildings a bit more to be more. Because that's just unacceptable. Yeah. Okay, good point. That's it's good to know. Because I was thinking the length of the building is going to be an issue. We're looking more at the articulation. That right. I mean, I mean, there was a point about the materials and the demonstration and the massing and all that. I mean, that's just, you know, that, I'm not again, that's why we're suggesting, again, we recognize the height's a bit different. <clears throat> Start, you know, to think of ways that we can mandate. We've done this in other redevelopment plans in area two over off uh, Boyden and Burnett. Right. There are regulations for that. There's no development to show for yet, but soon enough, hopefully, there will be. There are regulations that have that type of thing. Uh, other plans we've done elsewhere, certainly the Epstein site. This is the back side of the building, or the, uh, the 40 Park, yeah, the 40 Park, the Lefkins building, broken up vertically and horizontally. So we would encourage that thing. I think uh, lastly, to summarize the point, that that's actually the high point in the town, highest elevation. And that uh, any large structure, even any structure the same size as what's in town right is going to look larger. So um, I think that should be considered, and in particular in regards to the treatment of the facade and potential for setbacks, particularly up the public floor, that would possibly reduce the visual bulk of of the uh, structure, even even if it needed to be at a, a larger height. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, just in response to that thought, um, the mass of the building needs to be um, uh, modified or or controlled by setbacks and all of that. But there is an opportunity for something of height. Um, which could be an architectural feature or a tower or something like that, not, a, not an office tower, but something that could occupy the site and be more iconic. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do is just address the question that was raised earlier about the historical uh, occupation of that spot. Uh, Rickleton Square um, had this one building on it, which was the Rickleton School that became the municipal building that became the uh, library. But that entire area, including the um, parking lot, was basically a green space. But my recollection from 50 years ago was that the entire top end of town was a sleepy area. There's been so much of an intensification of the use with the uh, subdivision of the theater and the multiple units, the Wartburg becoming not a Christian science reading room, but actually you know, offices. So there's been a tremendous change uh, of the density of activity and use of the village, where it used to all be down at the intersection of Baker, uh, and it's moved up very much towards the train station. So historically, I think it's important to recognize that that building, and if you look at the murals in uh, uh, the uh, town hall, you'll see an image of the Rickleton School, and I think it could somehow be reflected in the architecture. However, the space has changed radically. I was just going to follow up on this gentleman's question about um, the next steps to ensure predictability in the form that gets built. I was just curious if part of the scope of services as part of the redevelopment plan would be to offer uh, urban design controls. Aside from like, the typical voting control, would there be urban design standards in that? Yes, very much. Exactly. Again, fenestration. Break up articulating the building vertically, horizontally, building materials, pitches of roofs if you have pitch roofs, you, right down to the last detail. Again, okay, that's one of the great benefits of the redevelopment plan. So we are intending to do that as part of the scope. Okay, I'll do a lot. Let me see if you're missing. I have a question on uh, have there been any studies on parking garages or do they suggest safety issues? 
I'd have to look into that. I've dealt with parking garages and other downtown settings. I know there's always concerns about safety, um, but I have to have, have any studies. We can do a little more research. I know, again, there was the controversy in town when they were proposed previously, um, but it, they do work in certain settings, so we'll have to look into that. But there, there Jerry are, has a question. Over I just have a comment. That everything I've read about them and people we've talked to, they're ungodly expensive to build. That's the yeah. <laughs> Really are. We are uh, finishing up a parking study for the village, and we should have that in the next couple of months, and that will talk to us about some um, possibilities of changing things. I don't know if it's going to come up with any structured parking recommendations. I'll we'll wait for that. that just, I guess we'll say, but right? well, we'll take a few more comments, but before people are leaving, I just want to make sure we get the next steps out there, then we can go back to the discussion, just real quick. There's not much to it, actually. What we do next is take all your comments into consideration, expand this framework into a formal, full-blown plan to start working with the Township Committee. Uh, at some point, have a third community meeting, the date's not set, and then depending on the timing of what the post office does, turn that into a more formal plan for introduction as an ordinance before the planning board, et cetera. So just so it's clear, we have ideas of where we're going from here. The timing is not set yet, but we think we've got enough for the information to start you know, put it down on paper, start having an actual plan more than just a, a presentation of <coughs> and, and just after the these are informal community meetings, but once we get to the point where we have a plan and we're considering it, then it goes before the township committee where there's a public hearing. It then goes to the um, planning board where there's a public hearing. It comes back to the township committee where there's a public hearing. So there's a lot of opportunity to make comments now. And after which there's a site plan and an application that's on the planning board for the formal design of the building as well. Will that plan be published for us to check out on the internet? Yes. Yeah. Everything we do is going to be put on our website. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the notes from the first public meeting are on the township's website now, so if you're curious and want to see a more thorough write up in my little uh, you know, summary of it, it is available. Yes. A quick footnote to the, one of the big objections to the New Jersey Transit uh, parking garage proposal years ago was that it was going to bring three or four hundred cars into the area. It wasn't restricted or, or designated for either our residential or retail use. They wanted to promote ridership. They would bring in people from anywhere and, and it was just, uh, that was one of the major objections. And they were going to take Nelson's garage and they were going to build the deck into the hillside. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so, uh, is there any feasibility of adding parking on the train station side? I mean, the village side is so yeah. limited in space. Um, we're, uh, is that part of that study? It, it's going to talk about it, but there's been no. Uh, the answer is it's unlikely. Yeah. Is the green space? Or? Well, it's just we're constrained there more than the village side, believe it or not. <laughs> Well, I, just, well, I did mention in the first meeting, I did speak to Vivian Baker and NJ Transit, who's responsible for transit-friendly land use, raised the issue of this site, also the Nell Road site, and asked the question about the lots and other things. It said, right now, given their current state, they're not looking to go build any additional parking, so it won't be transit doing that. If anything, NJ Transit is looking to privatize and have already expressed interest in privatizing some of their assets, meaning parking lots next to the stations. So there is, it's possible that one day they may Turn to an outside entity to do, you know, to reuse that parking to do something. No, no, let's not, let's not say that. That's not true. <laughs> Don't go out there and try. Where are you those lots? Um, we already, they are already privatized. The town manages those lots. So we manage the, the, the Baker Street lot and the lot next to the train station. Those are the two pieces that transit owns. We own everything else, and we manage those two lots. I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Vivian know that there's, we shouldn't be able to do She apparently wasn't, uh, didn't recall that, I'm sorry. Okay. Any other questions, comments at this point? Well, thank you very much. Uh, we can stick around here.